Hi everyone, I'm Carly. It is Wednesday, one o'clock. We're back to our normally scheduled programming of virtual safaris. And we're so excited to talk today about a really important species here at our zoo. And we're gonna talk with one of everyone's favorite keepers, Amanda, about them. So we've pulled Amanda away from drafts because she actually takes care of more than just Dobby. She takes care of our Chevalsky horses and our camels as well. And that's who we're talking about today, the pea horses. So have fun pronouncing that with your friends and family family or whoever you watch with. Before we get started, I really wanted to thank everyone who stepped up yesterday for Giving Tuesday. We met that Matthew so very much for helping us reach that goal. We could not have done it without the amazing generosity of all of our virtual safari viewers, our guests, everyone who donated. So thank you so much. Hi there, Jack. He is 10 years old. He's watching with us. Great to see you. So let's flip it around and talk about the pea horses. So here's Amanda. Hi, so tell us about, sorry about the Wi-Fi everyone today, but this is the Chevalsky Chevalsky horse. Chevalsky's so, horse, technically. Correct. <laughs> so uh, it is pronounced Chevalsky's, but it starts with a P as you can see on the sign. So it's P-R-Z-E-W-A-L-S-K-I-I. -I. Um, so that's a really hard word to try to say every time. So we call them P horses for short. <laughs> Um, they're also known as Mongolian horses, and the Mongolians actually refer to them as Taki, uh, which is spirit, and they adore these horses, and um, they actually do a lot with them, and they want to keep them around, because at one point they were actually extinct in the wild, um, which is why they're really, really near and dear to my heart here, um, because without zoos and um, parks, they actually would not be around anymore. So here at Denver Zoo, we actually have four of them. We have Mr. Batara right here, who is our stallion. He's the one with, uh, you can identify him because he actually has two dark marks on his shoulder. We'll see if we can get him to turn around. Oh yeah. Okay, so that's the stallion. And then the one in the back being a little more active is Yisun. She is our 16 year old female. She was actually born at the San Diego Zoo or San Diego Wild Animal Park, sorry. Um, and Batar was actually from Lowry Park in Florida. Um, coming up over on the other side of the sign is our youngest. He is four years old. His name is Batu. Um, and he was born here at Denver from a middle-aged girl will come over. But her name is Subi. Um, so we pronounce it Subi, but we do have friends from Mongolia that work here and come. And it would actually be pronounced Subi. Um, and the rough translation of that is Eye of the Needle. We actually really just liked the word and the name, so we named her Subi. Um, and then Batu, same thing, we just really liked the name. We looked up Mongolian names and his came up. And it actually turns out it was um, one of Genghis Khan's grandson's name. So um, lots of history with these guys. Um, <laughs> they obviously can be very active and that stallion definitely likes to get his treats. <laughs> Uh, so these guys actually are from Mongolia and live in the Gobi Desert, so they are used to dry, arid areas. Um, they eat everything. So you can always see that our yard always has sticks that look like they have been well-loved and well-chewed on. These guys love getting new sticks, and within uh, a few hours, they actually eat all the bark off of it. So we do provide them with all the hay that they want, but if we give them sticks, they will actually choose to eat the sticks over the hay first. Great, so we have a lot of people jumping in. Erica from England, Kathy from Parker, wow. Jessica in Maine, Kaylin, Eric says good afternoon. Kelsey in Virginia is watching. Um, so this is a species of horse. <laughs> Correct, so um, we have a different species of equid around the zoo. These ones are one of the true horses and they are actually known as the last wild horse. So in the horse world, you'd consider them ponies because of their height. They're only about four feet tall at the shoulder, um, but they are considered a horse uh, or zebra. So these guys are more closely related. The cool fun fact about them is that they have 66 chromosomes where domestic horses have 64. Um, long ago, they were trying to um, see if they could domesticate them, and this was way before any of our time. And so they were breeding them with domestic horses to be able to get their stamina and their ability to handle the cold 
where domestic horses are good with it, but not as good. So they would breed them. Uh, and it turns out that when they breed, they do look like Chevalsky horses, um, but their chromosomes change and they go from being 66 to 65. And they actually are fertile compared to other hybrid. All right, a couple questions about when the zoo is opening. We don't have any information for you on that yet, but we will announce it as soon as we know. But if you have questions for these animals and the Chevalsky horses, we'll definitely take them. How about we tell everyone what they're eating? So um, they do get that grass hay as their main diet. Um, and they get a morning grain, which is actually some, oh, I didn't put any in here. Um, so they already did get their morning grain, but as treats, we give them apples, carrots. I put in some yams. And these weird little things are banana biscuits, which are one of Dobby's favorites also. <laughs> but they're more of a, a grain type thing. They actually taste like banana, but these guys seem to like them as well. All right. Hi, Stacy from Ohio. Um, do they like other animals? Uh, so in other areas, um, especially ones with kind of more of a pasture exhibit, they would actually live with camels. And in their natural habitat, they would come in contact with camels. We have discussed in the future, um, kind of depends on where we go, that we can put them with the camels because they are pretty calm unless there's food and treats around. Um, but they would do really well with camels. Um, and that's the Bactrian camels, the two hump camels. Um, they all live in the Gobi Desert. So you can see Batar here has a very sleek um, coat right now. He has done most of it where the others still look a little shaggy because they're in the middle of shedding. So they get a nice thick coat and they will actually put on weight without our assistance for the winter so that they can handle those very cold days. Um, we do have a barn that you can see in back, but they rarely use it. They love being out in the snow and playing. Um, we usually try to post some fun pictures of them playing in the snow. <laughs> And same with those camels, they always get that really thick coat so that they are okay to be out in the colder temps. Uh, Lori is wondering if they're related to the extinct horses of North America. They are, they are in the sense that, um, again, if we were to get one of the, like the Mustangs and breed with them, they would be able to breed and they would have similar chromosomes, but those guys would have more of the 64 chromosomes versus their 66. Um, let's see, are they measured in hands like other horses? And can you explain what the hand measurement is? <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, so we do not measure them in hands, uh, more because they're not the most tractable animals. So I've done a lot of training with these guys. Batar was actually my first trainer. Um, I do work with horses at home. So the hand measurement is from the bottom. So from the ground up to what we call their withers, which is the top of their shoulder where that bump is right before their back. So where a saddle would sit. And so that's the most common area to measure horses. And a hand is about four inches um, in measurement. So a normal horse term would be, uh, you know, like 14 hands, 16 hands would be closer to like a thoroughbred. So these guys, I've never measured um, to actually get what the hands would be. I don't know actually how they would handle a tape measure. We might be able to use a fabric <laughs> tape measure because it doesn't make crinkling noises. But um, these guys are trained for our full hoof trims and giving injections and stuff like that. But I've never even tried to actually measure them. Lori has a two for one question. She wants to know what their lifespan is and what they weigh. Yeah, so um, their lifespan could be the uh, highest number is around 35. Um, but so, you know, it's a range 20s to 30s. Uh, Batar here just turned 14 and he weighs, uh, let me see if I can remember off the top of my head, it was right under 700 pounds. So that is his good summer weight. Uh, we don't want him losing any more than that. So we actually bump up their grain during the summer because their metabolism speeds up and we'll actually start losing weight. So we don't want him to go too low. He's actually had a pretty good body condition. Um, and then the females are a little bit lighter. They're around 640 pounds. Um, so that's about size for adults. When the juveniles or babies are born, um, they weigh around 40 pounds. Lydia's five. She wants to know if they have any predators. They don't here at the zoo, thankfully. <laughs> um, and not a lot out in Mongolia. So their biggest threat is actually from us humans. So um, when they were actually extinct in the wild, a lot of that had to do with human encroachment. So people going into their land and war and people taking over stuff and then some of diseases from the other horses that might have been around went to them. Kayla's curious if they can be trained to ride like a regular horse. 
So unfortunately, Kayla, these guys can be a little naughty compared to domestic horses and it really hasn't been done. Um, so a part of being domesticated is the way you would train them and if they are able to um, reproduce in more of a captive environment. So these guys are obviously captive, but we don't keep them in smaller areas. We keep them in larger areas so they can get away from each other. But every time they've tried to domesticate them and train them for um, human use, they don't do very well. And unfortunately, a lot of lives were lost in the process of trying it. So we have backed off and now it's a protection um, thing more than anything. So we have them trained for our healthcare, but that is it. So Batar loves scratches and we actually have special brush just for him, but um, otherwise we don't do anything else with them except for let them have some fun out here mm -hmm. and be horses. Uh, before we get to our next question, I want to make a quick plug for all the parents, teachers, kids who want something educational to do. We are launching Denver Zoo's virtual classroom, so we'll put the link to that in our comment section here. You can check out great resources, activities, videos, all geared uh, for that educational learning. We know you all love these lives and they're both entertaining and educating, but if you really want um, some just good old fashioned educational entertainment or educa educational information brought to you by our awesome education team. You can check out our virtual classroom. I feel like we should also say thank you to all those teachers. It's teacher yes, appreciation it is. week. Yes, and that is a great time to mention. It's <laughs> teacher appreciation week. So for all the teachers who have been that remote learning, making sure their kids are staying on top of that work, even from afar, we appreciate you more than ever. So thank you to our teachers. Um, Chris is wondering what kind of veterinarian care they get. So thankfully, not a ton. These guys are pretty resilient. So um, Batar here did have an issue uh, about five years ago. Um, his feet grow exponentially long, uh, kind of quickly. So uh, he runs a lot, he does everything he's supposed to do, but for whatever reason, his genetics, his feet grow fast. So uh, he is trained for hoof trims. I, myself and another keeper do a lot of the farrier work on our own. We have classes with our farrier to be able to learn how to properly trim their feet. So we do the maintenance of them and the farrier comes every few months or if we ever have an issue, he comes to check them out. But he knows how to line up to a fence that's in back. Um, it looks similar to a cattle panel so that he can present his side and we can pick up all four feet by just asking him to turn around. So they are not halter trained. Um, it is all positive reinforcement and operant conditioning. So if he decides he doesn't want to work for the day, he can leave. Mm -hmm. um, so they are all trained for that. Um, that is their biggest, I guess, medical uh, training we do, but they're all injection trained. So just like a domestic horse and most other animals, we do get vaccinations every year. Um, so they're all trained for that. They are trained to get on the scale. So we weigh them once a month just to make sure that what our eyes are seeing is what we're seeing on the scale. Um, Subi, who just walked over in the middle over there, she's actually trained for an open mouth behavior. Um, it was kind of a fun little thing to teach her just because I was running out of ideas on fun different things to teach her and the vets asked if we could teach them how to open their mouth, which was an interesting thing to teach, but she does it and she allows a flashlight in there just so we can check. May, age four, says, do you think they miss her? Of course they do, May. We all miss you. We can't wait for you guys to come back. You'll have to come see them hopefully soon. We miss all of you. Yes, great question, May. Uh, you're welcome, Chris. We're happy to answer that. Jill, uh, we talked about this a little earlier. These horses have 66 chromosomes. Yes, so 66 chromosomes, Jill, a.k.a. my mother. Um, and uh, 66 chromosomes versus the wild, or sorry, versus the domestic horses that have 64, and the hybrids would have 65. So um, a little bit different, but still related. So Catherine has a great question. We talked a little bit about how this species was extinct in the wild until zoos and parks came together to help reintroduce them. Is that still going on and how is it going? Yeah, it's awesome. So um, I had to write it down because I'm really bad at remembering the timelines. <laughs> but um, in the 1940s is when they actually started finding that the decline of the wild horses were, was going down significantly. Um, after World War II ended, they had not been able to find nearly as many. So in um, 1969, that was the last confirmed sighting and it was actually just of one stallion. A few years later, they were unable to find him. So whether he moved on, he had passed at that time, they don't really know. So um, after years and years of trying to search for him, in 1996, they were actually 
um, announced to be extinct in the wild. So that was a pretty big hit on them. Uh, that's when zoos really stepped it up and started pushing to get them reintroduced. So in 2008 was a pretty awesome year because they went from being extinct in the wild and after all that reintroduction and all the rebuilding of the species, in 2008 they were bumped up to critically endangered meaning they're still on the lookout and they could still go extinct in the wild but we're getting closer and then amazingly enough in 2011 they got bumped up again to being endangered and that's because their numbers are going up so there are only 400 of them in the mongolia area at this point now that would be considered wild so they do release them into an area that is protected so that we don't have to worry about them getting slaughtered, um, being pushed out of the area. Um, and we're getting ready to open up another um, rehab area, I guess you would call it, in Russia, so that it's another stepping point to be able to release them into the wild. That is a great, thorough answer. Thank you so much, Amanda. A lot of questions about their personalities. <laughs> who's sassy? Who's oh, friendly? No. Who's got the attitude? So Batar, even though he's being a little bit of a naughty right now, <laughs> he has, he's a big sweetheart. So I always laugh that for a stallion, he doesn't act like a stallion. So in the horse world, stallions can sometimes get a really bad um, name for themselves because they can be kind of pushy and be really aggressive and he can be as you've seen he's going after the girls trying to get all that food for himself but with us he's a big sweetheart um we do treat him as though he is a stallion though so we always have something with us or between us so that we have protection we don't want to get hurt by him on accident or intentional um so he's the big sweetheart who is definitely in charge and then Yi soon is the shy one so you can see her and she's the next one over um, although she is the head mare, she definitely um, listens to what Batar says. But if there's danger, everyone goes to Yisun and Batar will protect everyone. Um, Subi is the subordinate. Um, she stays off on her own quite a bit, but she'll hang out with Batu a decent amount. And Batu is very, very, very mischievous. Mm -hmm. Um, similar to a very, very mischievous other animal I work with a lot that you all love, Dobby, uh, Batu likes to play tricks on us. So if we're out there cleaning with them, which we do on occasion, he tries to dump our wheelbarrows. He blocks our wheelbarrows so we can't um, put stuff in it. Um, and mostly just so that he can get attention. He loves scratches, so he'll do everything in his power to get some scratches, just like his father. <laughs> Ruby is four. She and her mom, Blair, want to know if there are any babies on the way. There, unfortunately, are not. So Denver Zoo and all the zoos around the NDA um, participate in the Species Survival Plan. So um, one of the other parts of that is the stud bookkeeper. So thankfully, I am cool like excited to announce that I am the stud bookkeeper for these guys so I take care of knowing how many animals there are in North America and where they're all located and then somebody who's above me actually um, helps determine where they go so he's the coordinator and he puts it into a program and shows who is related to who so unfortunately Batar and Yisun because they had the two foals are not slated to breed too soon so um, she is currently not on birth control because we are actually checking to see if the birth control is reversible. So they are okay to breed right now, but as of right now, we have not seen any breeding and know of any babies. So, um, she is at her beautiful, perfect weight. Um, so if she would be getting pregnant, it would be this season because they are seasonal because of that cold weather that they live in. So between April and August is usually their season. I say that because sometimes in warmer zoos, they go, um, they go a little later. Katar is that was really cute. And, I couldn't help it. and signaling that he would like some more treats. That's his favorite behavior is to put his foot on stuff. So. Uh, Leo wants to know what Batar's favorite toy or enrichment item oh, is. Oh, his favorite toy. So Batar doesn't like to play as much. I think his favorite toy is us. <laughs> um, but Batu has a giant mega ball that is on the very far side. It's an inflatable ball over there. Uh, and he will play with that for hours. Um, Batar thinks as long as there's treats, all the other toys are awesome. But if there's no treats in them, he doesn't play with them. <laughs> Jessica is really curious about who you think the horse's favorite keeper is. Oh, well, <laughs> I, I'll be biased and just say me. <laughs> uh, so we do, we do have five keepers that work with them on a normal basis. Um, two of us work with them 
even more. And then we have a third new keeper who is winning his way into all of their <laughs> hearts. Um, they actually do react to all of us different and they know whose buttons they can push and whose buttons they can't push because some of us just ignore them if they start being naughty, which is, they don't like that. <laughs> so if they are being nice, they get scratches. If they change those ears, then they don't get scratches. How about our? <laughs> Ethan is wondering why do horses have manes? Ooh, so uh, some of it is for protection. So these guys, um, this herd specifically actually doesn't have much aggression. So even though you saw Batar kind of being a little mean to the girls, he's a very, very sweet stallion. So some of them can be really aggressive and they'll jump up on there and that's a part of what they hold on to for breeding or fighting. So um, you'll see the stallions actually have a really, really thick neck also. So his neck is taller and thicker than the mares. And that's so that um, when they're fighting or when he is mounting them, that their neck does not get injured. Oh, he's doing that cute little behavior. He's just learned a new way to Seriously, into I'm Amanda's to heart for treats. So cute. Um, Jessica's also wondering if they get spooked easily. They used to. So um, the they we used to actually be really careful around them because. We haven't necessarily had it here, but other zoos have had them spook bad enough that they run into fences. Um, we have not had that happen here. and We don't plan to have that happen here. Um, so we do, we've been working really hard with these guys to build their resilience against scary things. So when Tigers was built, which is right next door, they had a lot of scary stuff going on and we actually allowed a lot of scary stuff to happen and we just watched them. So if the walls were flying over the perimeter fence, we actually fed them more so that they could see it and know what was going on than actually hide it from them. So now they've gotten to the point where anytime there's anybody around or large equipment around, they actually come and watch. We always joke that they're supervising. Mm -hmm. They are. When we had Pele in the daffodil meadow behind us, they were very right. interested in what she was doing. Alma's six. She wants to know, how do you tell what mood a horse is in? And do they sound like regular horses when they do that braying? Yep, so they do down, sound like normal horses. Every morning they call us when they see us because you know, just like every animal, they think they're hungry even though they still have food left over. Uh, so they do greet us just like that. They do a whinny and a neigh, just like a normal horse. Um, I'm sorry, I forgot what her other part of her question was. Uh, I have forgotten too. <laughs> um, We'll get back to it. Okay. Uh, <laughs> it was a really good, it was a good question. We will find it. I've lost it in the fast and furious comments. Um, meanwhile, Chani wants to know, are they released into the wild as family units or when they're young? Um, middle. So the way it works is like these guys are so used to us and so used to humans that we would not ever put these guys out into the wild. So that would be really dangerous for them. So what it would be is if say Subi was recommended to go back to the wild, we would send her to somewhere where um, there's a zoo in Ohio called the wilds and they have a ton of acreage where they have very little human contact if needed. So she would go there. Her offspring would go then to Prague or to Russia to have even more distance between humans. And then those offspring would get released. So it seems silly, but we want to make sure that these guys don't come near humans because that is actually what is killing them. So. Um, it's not as easy as you would think, but usually around two to five is when they become sexually mature. So that is when it would be a little bit safer because they are stronger to be released back into the wild. I found Alma's second half oh, of good. her question. How do you tell what mood they're in? Oh, that's right. So just like a normal domestic horse, these guys is like to tell you through their body. So those ears are a really good indication. He's going to paw again. <laughs> um, so the ears are the biggest thing. If their ears are forward, I like to call them airplane ears, which you can see Yisun doing in the middle. That's a... I'm good, I'm happy, I'm fine. Um, if their ears go further back, that's a, I'm starting to get a little bit mad. And that's when we would put something between us or get out of their way because usually it's a bite or a chase that's about to happen. Um, so it's a lot about reading behavior, um, which, you know, the more you're around them, the more you can see it. And you can even see it with them, which is the best way we can learn is just by sitting here watching them and seeing how they interact. All right, Alma, sorry we had to do that in two parts, but I hope you got your, your answer. Uh, Christopher's wondering, are they related to zebras? Um, very distantly. So they're all equids, um, but these guys are considered a horse where a zebra is more considered an ass. So the Somali wild ass and the zebras are more closely related than these guys are. Very good. Uh, Ethan's wondering what else they get for enrichment. 
Oh, they get lots of stuff. Um, th so we actually had the sprinklers on this morning so that we could water. We're trying to get grass to grow, which you can kind of see a little bit of grassy fuzz. Um, and Bator actually stood in the sprinkler this morning. Um, we have a mud wallow in back that they love to play in. When it gets really hot out, they actually splash around. Um, they have lots of balls that they like to play with. We hang stuff up a lot so they can bang it around. Um, sticks are definitely a high up there. One, you can even see we have two brand new trees in here and one of them has already been eaten and dead now. Uh, the <laughs> other one we're trying to save with some wrapping. Um, otherwise, just the social aspect and natural stuff is their favorite um, enrichment. That's a good one. Would you say they're more of a social species or solitary? Definitely social. So the only time they'd really be um, solitary is when the colts or the boys get kicked out by the dad. He's so handsome. Um, until they find their own herd. And then they would be social again. So these guys are herd animals. Um, they could live in anywhere from, you know, two or three like this to 20, depending on how uh, mighty that stallion is and willing to take care of that many. Because he would be the one who is the protector and will take care of them. Ethan's wondering what makes them mad? <laughs> um, not much. Uh, food. Uh, Mr. Batar here really likes his food so that's why everyone else is staying back so that <laughs> he doesn't get grouchy. It's kind of like when you try to take food off dad's plate that's his favorite <laughs> plate. It, that doesn't always work out. <laughs> Um, and then for the people who just joined in, let's go over the names and ages one more time. Yep. So these are our Shavalsky horses. We call them P horses for short. They're Mongolian wild horses. And we have uh, mom and dad. So Batar over here is 14. He just turned 14 on Sunday and he's from Lowry Park Zoo in Florida. <laughs> he says hello. He's begging for treats. Um, Yisun is in the middle. She's our oldest. She is 15. She just turned 15 last at, well, the end of last month. Um, and she is from San Diego Safari Park in California. And then next is Batu. He is our youngest. He is four years old. He's born here at Denver Zoo to Yisun and Bat Batar. And then Subi is on the far end. She is about to turn seven. Her birthday is on the 31st of, Mar or of May. Um, and yeah, and she was also born here to Yisun and Batar. And so they are the offspring of Yisun and Batar. Correct. So it's one little nuclear family yep. <laughs> unit that we the have best here. Little family. They are so fun. All right, I'm seeing a few more questions. Jessica's wondering if they're smart. Do they learn easy? Uh, they do. It took me longer to teach them than it took them. So going from um, working with domestic horses and using halter and stuff, you know, we don't want them to be halter trained. We want them to be wild horses. So I had to adapt things. Um, I worked in Predator Ridge for a while and um, working protected contact with the lions actually kind of helped with this. It seems silly, but I had to adjust it a little because working with carnivores is a little different than working with the prey animals. So everything I do is through protected contact. So again, there's that fence between us. And it took me a while to figure out how to ask Batar to give me his side and how that it was okay. So um, for him, it wasn't as bad because he's really food motivated, but one of the horses, it took six months to even get her to eat from my hand. So she's not here anymore. She was an older lady and it took her a while. Um, the juveniles took no time at all since mm. they were around us from the day one. They, they know everything very quickly where Batar, just because he needed to teach me, it took a few years to be able to get that hoof trim done. Cool. And last one, how can we tell them apart? Batar has the, I would say like the darkest yep. neck coloring and then two dark spots on his shoulders. Yep. So he's to... by far the darkest and overall biggest. <laughs> um, Yisun is kind of got more of a dark brown face. And then she also, um, a while ago, one of the ways to be able to tell animals apart before they started doing transponders is they would put a little nick in their ear and she actually has those. So again, that was a while ago. They don't do that as much anymore. Batu is the littlest and has only one spot on each of his shoulders. Um, also, usually his mane is shorter and he's lighter than Batar. Um, obviously the boys, we can see their boy parts. So that's a little easier also. And then Subi, if she would turn back around, her face is almost more black than brown compared to Yisun. So she has more of a dark, more black coloring than you soon has the dark brown coloring. Yeah. All right. So that's very helpful. You'll just have to spend a lot of time at the pea horse habitat so you can see them and really get to know. You can kind of quiz yourself and you might see Amanda walk by and you can ask her. So you can, you can definitely always ask a keeper to tell you the difference. And they just know 
who's who because they work with him every day. It's like a parent of twins. And what is Yisun doing right now? <laughs> She's scratching her head. She loves those sticks. We usually find hair underneath them, <laughs> um, mostly from her. Subi will do it quite a bit too, trying to get all that excess hair out. <laughs> Very fun. Well, this is our Shavalsky horse family. Thank you so much to Amanda. Again, a very special shout out. Thank you to our teachers. It's Teacher Appreciation Week, and you have never been more appreciated than now. Amanda, I think you can yeah. agree with that, yeah. having kids at home. Yeah, I'd rather have my kids being taught by their teachers all the time. <laughs> you all are amazing at what you do, and we really appreciate you. And parents, if you're looking for some added uh educational content to give your kids you can go to Denver Zoo's virtual classroom we're really excited to launch that and then thank you to everyone who donated today and on Giving Tuesday we met that match goal you all so thank you so much for being so generous with your money for Giving Tuesday now we really appreciate it here at Denver Zoo I will take one more question from Joseph he wants to know when do they get full grown uh, closer between four and five so yeah, Batu is just about there. Um, he could probably gain about 50 more, 50 more pounds and get a little bit bulkier, um, but he's almost there. All right, thank you everyone. Thank you to Amanda. Thank you to our Shavalsky horses and thanks to all of you viewers and guests and people who are joining in on these virtual safaris. We appreciate it. We'll be posting this full thing later on our YouTube page. Bye.